Travis Bader, and this is the Silvercore Podcast. Silvercore has been providing its members with the skills and knowledge necessary to be confident and proficient in the outdoors for over 20 years, and we make it easier for people to deepen their connection to the natural world. If you enjoy the positive and educational content we provide, please let others know by sharing, commenting, and following so that you can join in on everything that Silvercore stands for. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a member of the Silvercore club and community, visit our website at silvercore.ca. Today's guest is a wildlife health biologist who, for the last 17 years, has been working with the BC Provincial Government Wildlife Health Program. She's involved with priority disease surveillance programs such as bovine tuberculosis and chronic wasting disease, which is the subject of today's talk. Welcome to the Silvercore podcast, Kate Nelson. Hi, Travis. Thanks for having me. You know, we've talked a lot in the past back and forth. I'm really happy to have you on the podcast here. It's uh, unfortunate the circumstances, which is precipitating the, the chat that we're seeing CWD, chronic wasting disease in British Columbia. Um, you know, it was what, depending on when this podcast releases, there's going to be a little bit of a span. It's about a week ago or so that we started seeing all of the announcements coming through backcountry hunters and anglers and the BC Wildlife Federation and in the newspapers that chronic wasting disease has now been spotted and confirmed in British Columbia. Yeah, that's right. We, uh, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, which is the, the ref, um, the reference laboratory, confirmed um, the first two cases uh, and they came uh, from deer samples from our Kootenai region. So that was the first time CWD was detected in, in BC. So yeah, we're about a week in now. I couldn't believe the amount of uh, questions that I've been getting. We put up a poll on social media saying that I'm going to be having a talk and do you have questions? Holy crow. The number of people that have been inundating us with a lot of club members and people through social media and, uh, friends are, are saying like, can we find out this? Can we find out that? And a lot of them are the same. I can only imagine what's it like in your office right now? Are you getting inundated? Yeah. Yeah. Short answer is yes. Um, okay. it's, it's been very busy, uh, but it's also really great to see, um, the interest and tend to see all of these groups and individuals and, you know, communities that are reaching out to say, how can we help? How can we support? Mm. And, um, so that's been, you know, really a a wonderful thing to be going through, you know, if it, it, it has been super intense and of course it's, 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 um, really, uh, too bad, you know, nobody wanted this uh, event (laughs) to happen, but we have been anticipating it and preparing for it. Mm. And so it, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a sad day for sure that we've now detected this disease in BC, but, um, I'm sort of energized, I guess, by, by the incredible community and support, um, that we're receiving already, um, you know, just with people reaching out and, Lots of questions, and I hope that, you know, really appreciate the invitation today um, to have a chat with you because, uh, you know, this is a platform where we can reach a lot of people and hope to address some of those questions because it's hard for for us to, you know, actually connect with all of those people, you know, directly, um, and we know there's a lot of questions out there. So so hopefully by doing this, we can we can help share the information more effectively. Yeah. And we were talking off air as well here about, uh, the release of this episode. So I've got some planned episodes that are looking at releasing and I'm, uh, looking at bumping that timeline up based on the fact that there's so much new information that's coming to light. So what we talk about here is going to be fairly timely from when we're talking about it, Mm -hmm. but people who are interested in this and they want to learn more, they should be checking out what the, uh, I'm sure the provincial government's got a website that they can be re- referring to, to see all the updates. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. We're really in the, the early stages of this. Um, again, we had, you know, put a lot of work into preparing for this, um, mm. running through scenarios, what kind of resources we're going to need what kind of expertise we're going to need. Um, so thankfully we had a lot of that in place so that we could hit the ground running, but this really is 
um, you know, a, a information gathering. We want to make sure that we understand what's going on on the landscape right now. And we're pulling those, mm. those key facts together so that we can, you know, make informed decisions and science-based decisions moving forward. But yeah, we're, we're really in, in the thick of it right now. And, and as more information is coming in daily and uh, it will, it'll provide a clearer picture of, of what's, um, what's unfolding, you know, on the landscape. And so, yeah, yeah, it was, it was sort of, <laughs> um, this is sort of a snapshot, but every day there's new information coming in and, and that's going to um, give us a more complete picture of the, the well, scope I'll and do, scale of this, right? Mm, so what I'll do just to keep this a bit more evergreen in front of people's minds mm. is we can communicate afterwards as things progress. If there's big announcements to come out, mm -hmm. I'll throw it up in the show notes. Right. I'll put it into the, on the website mm -hmm. and the YouTube and in the description. So people ha at least have links where they can click and check out what the new information on this is. Right. Yeah. So we, we do have a, we do have a BCCWD website and that's going to be a good mm. resource um, for people to check out where we're going to be posting um, new information and, and some communication stuff. Uh, all of our uh, test results as they come in, will go up on our website. So so yeah, we'll make sure everybody has that link. Perfect. Um, well, let's start at the beginning. What is, what do we know? What do we know about chronic waste and disease? Where did it start? What does it do? Um, how does it spread? Okay. So, so chronic waste and disease is a infectious disease that affects species in the deer family, um, or cervids. And so that includes deer, elk, moose, and caribou, um, it's fatal in all cases. When an animal becomes infected, they will die from the disease. And we still don't have any treatment or vaccines available. So this is a, a fatal disease. Um, it's caused by an abnormal misshapen protein called a prion. And so, uh, you know, normal proteins in our bodies, they, they all have, you know, different functions and they're um, designed to sort of complete that function and they'll, they'll break down into their component parts and kind of get recycled in the body. But these, these disease causing prions, um, for whatever reason, they don't break down, they accumulate in the tissue and they can be present in all tissues of the animal, but they really tend to concentrate and, and, um, increasingly concentrate in the central nervous system in the brain. And mm -hmm. so what ends up happening is a neurological disease. And so there's, there's damage to the brain tissue that, um, that ultimately leads to the demise of that animal. And so, um, one of the tricky, well, there's several tricky things about this disease, but one of them is that, um, most animals that are, that test positive for the disease, as we've seen in other places, um, they don't actually show, uh, outward symptoms or those symptoms aren't really always obvious. So a lot of animals that test positive are healthy looking hunter harvested animals. So I talk to hunters often that, you know, they'll say they're so surprised that their animals tested positive. This is like BC hunters that have harvested animals in Alberta or, you know, elsewhere where, where they've had this disease for a while. Mm -hmm. um, or be, hunters in BC who I, I talk to and they say, no, I, I didn't submit my my head for testing this year because the, the, my animal I harvested was really healthy, looked really good. And mm. so that's tricky because there's no way to, um, often there's no way to tell just visually if an animal is infected with this disease. And so it's, um, that's why testing animals is so important. Um, but it also makes managing the disease on the landscape a challenge because there's no, um, you don't see sick animals on the landscape. It's very rare to see sick animals on the landscape, even in places like Alberta, where there's a really high proportion of the animals are infected. Now you just don't really see sick animals on the landscape. So there's no signal mm -hmm. for us that something's wrong. Um, so anyway, that's a challenging aspect. Another challenging aspect of this disease is um, these disease causing uh, prions or proteins um, in an infected animal they'll actually shed the, the animal will shed these, these prions through their saliva or other bodily fluids into the environment. They can also be shed uh, through carcasses that are decomposing in the environment. And so that environmental contamination acts aspect of this disease makes it super challenging 
to, um, to, to control because not only do we have direct transmission between animals through nose to nose mm. contact, um, but there's contamination of the environment and, and um, these animals that are shedding again, they they're infected with the disease, but they don't really often show that those outward symptoms. So, so they can still be shedding the disease, even though they don't appear to be sick. And so once these, these prions get into the environment, um, they'll remain there active and inf infectious and could potentially expose other animals indirectly through, you know, an animal, um, you know, consuming some vegetation or, you know, these prions can be in the soil on plants and in water and things mm. like that. And um, they are very, these prions are very um, indestructible, really. Um, they're resistant to heat, like burning and cooking doesn't um doesn't sort of deactivate the pre the protein um really disinfectants to, like you know other cleaning methods won't um won't you know kind of neutralize them in the environment and so it's it, there's not really any way to clean up those environments once they've been contaminated and so then that becomes a a site where other animals can pick it up from yeah so th this is kind of like if I'm not mistaken, like I remember 96, 97 and everyone was mad cow disease is a big thing. And that's, mm -hmm. I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, but bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Yeah. Is that? Yeah. Bun uh, yeah. Bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Yeah. Encephalopathy. Yeah. I knew I'd almost oh, get it. Very close. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I, I remember I, uh, I was 19 years old. I flew over to the UK mm. and this was all on the mind. Everyone's talking about this mad cow disease. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm not going to eat any meat. And the first meal that I had was at a friend's grandmother's house where I was staying was a big roast beef dinner. Yeah. I'm like, well, I can't, I can't, you I can't, can't say no. have to eat this. Someone's grandma's right. making that meal. Yeah. Totally. And <laughs> you know that she put a lot of effort and, and it cost a bit and all the rest. And so I ate it gladly and I thought, I guess I'm not giving blood for the next few years mm. because that, that's what the rules were around that. This, that, that'd be a prion sort of uh, infection within bovine, is it pretty similar to what we're seeing here in the service? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, so BSC or mad cow disease is another, th another type of prion disease. Um, they're part of this family of diseases called, um, transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. So they're, you know, transmissible between animals. The spongiform actually, uh, describes th what the the brain tissue looks like because when the prions accumulate mm. in the brain, um, it causes cell death and you actually get holes in the brain. And so that's where the spongiform, like it actually has a sponge-like appearance. And then encephalopathy just means, a, you know, a disease of the brain. And so um, this group of diseases, prion diseases, include mad cow disease. There's also a prion disease in sheep and goats called scrapie. People might have heard of that. Um, there are some human forms. Creutzfeldt Jakob disease is a prion disease that uh, occurs in humans. And, and there's a number of other ones. Um, so they're all caused by these abnormal proteins called prions, the part of this group of, of diseases, TSCs. But, um, but different pr uh, prion diseases are, are quite, um, they're quite different from each other. And so mm. um, for, you know, mad cow disease, for example, is very different. Like you actually have to consume the meat of the cattle to become infected. Those, those an animals don't, don't shed the pre prion into the environment. Um, so they all have differences. They, they tend to have these very um, strong, what we call species barriers. So they don't cross between species groups very readily. And so that's, you know, that's how we know that with chronic wasting disease, um, in a natural environment, we don't believe it will transfer to other, to other species like cattle or, you know, other livestock mm. or domestic animals. There's no evidence of that happening. So they're, they're, you know, they're unique in that way to that, um, species group. Um, coming back to the human health concern touched on with BSC, um, there's no direct evidence that chronic wasting disease can be transmitted to humans. As far as we know, there hasn't been a, a documented case of CWD in, in a human, but there's still a lot we don't know about these prion diseases. And so 
I mean, we refer to the public health folks for recommendations on this. And, mm. you know, coming from the World Health Organization and all the way down to, you know, Health Canada and our local public health folks, um, their position is that we can't, the risk of transmission to people might be low, but we can't rule it out completely. So they recommend a precautionary approach and advise that any animal that is infected with CWD should not be eaten. And so, you know, there, there definitely are some human health concerns. Um, that's the information we have so far is, is to, you know, be cautious about this because we just don't know for sure. So that would be called zoonotic if it transmits from a, an animal to a human, right. right? Like yeah. mad cow was able to make that jump from an animal to a human. Yeah. It's a zoonotic transmission. Totally. Uh, have you seen that research in the University of Calgary? A couple of really bright cookies started putting human, um, um, I don't know, human something within mice, yeah. Uh, yeah, human proteins, even something in mice. Yeah. And they're saying, hold on a second. We're seeing in this lab base, not an actual mm -hmm. from animal to human, but in, it's affecting these human um, proteins. And, and you're going to correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, um, it's not uh, presenting in the way that it would in the survey. It's presenting very differently. And a couple years later, yeah. have, you, have you been following that? Uh, you know, a little bit. I'm not super familiar mm. with it, but I do, you know, I, I, I am familiar with some of those studies that have looked at, you know, pushing that species barrier in a research setting, whether it be with, um, you know, humanized mice or they, or cervidized mice, they can put like, you know, the, mm. that cervid kind of component in a, in a research animal, like a, a rodent. Um, there's also been some studies looking at, um, transmission of prion disease to non-human primates. And that's where mm. some of the uncertainty has come from these, these, you know, we haven't seen it in a natural setting or haven't, you know, documented this in a natural setting, but in some of these research settings, um, the results, the findings of these studies have been sort of inconsistent. And there, they, you know, there's a few studies that where there was evidence that, um, you know, primates that consumed CWD infected deer meat actually developed the disease. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, other studies, similar studies had different results in the end. So sort of inconsistent. Um, and so all, you know, all just kind of cumulatively leading to some uncertainty around it and, and why, um, public health advises us to just take a precautionary approach until we, we can understand this more, more completely. Right. I, I know, uh, a couple of friends over in Alberta, they went and they harvested their, uh, a white-tailed deer, mm -hmm. butchered it, packed it, it's in the freezer, heads off getting inspected, and then they get a note back sometime later saying, it's got chronic wasting disease, we recommend that you take it to the landfill, dump it all in the landfill. Mm -hmm. So they're pretty upset because now they're out the money for the hunt, they're out their meat, they're out the tag because it, their tag doesn't get uh, reimbursed off of the uh, the whole thing from my understanding. Mm -hmm. and. Um, um, and I see that as one of the questions that we're getting a lot of, um, number one was like, what is it? And we've talked a little bit about that and how do we identify it? That was one. And I think you've kind of answered that one in so far as you, maybe, maybe if it's really progressed down the way, but a lot of times you don't. Yeah. Especially, healthy looking especially animal, in, in hunter harvested animals, hunters are, are not going to be targeting those sick looking animals, right? And so, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, the, just visually you're right. You're correct. There's, there's no way to tell. Um, and so we, you know, it, it recommend and, and encourage hunters to get animals tested. Um, you know, one to have that peace of mind for the, you know, for them and, and their family that's going to be consuming the meat. But for, for our perspective, that information from that animal and understanding, um, you know, pr providing that information to feed into our surveillance program so that we have a, a, a better understanding of health of populations in BC. Um, every, every negative test that comes back is super valuable, especially, you know, right now in this, in this scenario that we are in, 
um, we've had two positive cases, but we are looking at, at hundreds of um, negative cases. And that is just as valuable to look at on mm. the landscape. Well, we've tested all these animals in this area and, you know, we have good confidence that the disease is not there. And that's mm. so important to us right now. It allows us to focus in and, and, you know, target our approaches and our resources where we really need to be looking. So um, anyway, I'm kind of going off, off uh, course here, but, uh, that's all good. but yeah, I've had lots of conversations with, BC residents that have harvested animals in in Alberta, for example, and have late, you know brought the meat back and found out that those animals are positive. And um, what generally happens in BC is they're notified by the Alberta program, and then the Alberta program has notified us, so we can follow mm. up um, around the disposal, right? Because now we we know that there's CWD um, um, CWD confirmed material in somebody's freezer in BC and um, the advice is that they don't eat it, but it's up to them if they want to eat it or mm -hmm. not. But we always reach out and say, if you do want to, if you don't want to eat this, please consider transferring it over to us so we can dispose of this safely. Cause we don't want people just, you know, burning it in their backyard because then that's just going to mm. get into the soil or, or throw it in the bush or something like that. Um, we actually will, will request that the hunter turns that meat over to us so we can have it incinerated at our agriculture mm. lab because incineration is as as far as we know the only effective way to denature these um these prions and so then we know it's disposed of safely and, and there's no risk of it coming into the um our environment in bc but um but those are hard conversations you know with with all mm -hmm. of the struggles right now with you know just access to to food and and the cost of food and everything um to ha to have to make those decisions around wasting meat like that it's it's really it's it's heartbreaking and it um, is. um you know more and more hunters in other places like alberta and saskatchewan i mean they've been dealing with this for a while um but you know we've only just really had a taste of it we've been really lucky in bc that we haven't had those kinds of impacts yet so you know why we've been trying to stay ahead of this and be proactive and try and catch us as, as quickly as possible so that we don't repeat um, some of those unfortunate situations that have played out in other places where the disease has just taken hold and is in a, a large number of the populations now. Where did we first start seeing CWD and what happened to the, the landscape? Yeah, so we don't know for sure where it originated. And so um, we, the first documented cases of chronic wasting disease were uh, out of Colorado, Wyoming in the 1960s, um, mm. mainly centered around a, like a research or ca a research facility and cap captive animals. And um, at that time in the 60s, they, they didn't know what CWD was. It wasn't, it wasn't a thing yet. Um, but mm. later, several years later, I think it was almost a decade later, they they just, they were like, okay, this is a prion disease that's occurring in cervids and, and, you know, defined it as chronic wasting disease at that time. Um, but, you know, the, in those first uh, years or even the first couple of decades, it, um, they really didn't understand the disease and how it was transmitted, how it could affect, you know, it, um, contaminate the environment. So they didn't really have the tools to manage it or contain it. And so it moved around through, um, captive populations through the farming industry and through wildlife populations it, it you know crossed over the fence in both directions and it was spread around quite a bit in the states and then you know came into Canada in the 19 um, 1990s into Saskatchewan through um, uh, cap game farmed elk and uh, so yeah it moved around a lot before we could really anybody really understood the disease and how it was spread and then, you know, um, so some of those earlier hit places, I think, have seen some of the most significant impacts because, again, just didn't have the tools or the understanding of how to manage this disease. Um, we now have the benefit of several years now, uh, you know, lessons learned, uh, watching these places that are managing CWD and, and what's worked and what hasn't worked. And uh, mm. we have more tools in the in the toolbox now, for sure, and better understanding of just the disease dynamics and how it's spread. 
Well, what, um, when, when we, so I, I guess, how long do we have an idea of how long those prions are going to be in the environment? Let's say an animal is killed by a wolf and it's mm -hmm. down and it's decomposing, or maybe it's transmissible through its saliva or feces or urine or whatever. Is it kind of there indefinitely or is it got a bit of a shelf life? We don't um, actually know. Again, it's one okay. of these things that we don't fully understand about the disease. Um, you know, on, on, um, relative to other diseases, it really hasn't been around very long. So we haven't um, really seen an endpoint yet, uh, uh, you know, for some of these things. We're still watching and learning and seeing how it, how it impacts populations. So, so there has been some studies done, I think, um, looking at the prions that cause scrapie, I think, is one, one study that found that the prions can exist in the environment for over 15 years but that was just sort of the, wow. the length of that study it's probably more it's probably longer so we don't really know but several years for sure um there's been some other work that has showed how these prions interact with the environment and soil different soils and so different soil types will actually um, bind to prions in the ground and will will make them more they keep, sort of keep them at the surface so they're more available to other animals whereas other soil types might you know with rain and they wash they wash through and they're not as um sort of available at the surface so anyway all all of these things there's there's different um different factors uh different variables on the landscape that will impact this but as you know as far as we know the the prions will remain active we could say or infectious and and with the potential to expose other animals for several years even if in the absence mm. of those sick animals that originally deposited them there well that's an interesting question about the environment are there certain environments that just become prion cesspools that the hunter going in there knows that if i'm rolling the dice i'm the odds aren't in my favor and other ones where if they want to roll those dice, the odds might be in their favor. Yeah. Again, it's um, not something that we fully understand sort of on the landscape, mm -hmm. but there's definitely been some evidence of what we call CWD hotspots where um, animals will visit a site. Um, if there's, if there's like an attractant, um, if there's some sort of a food source and multiple animals are coming to that site and they sort of are, congregating together, um, you know, it makes sense that, you know, they're sort of coming back to that site, they're all eating there, every, you know, everyone's drooling and urinating on that spot. So those are areas where you um, tend to see higher rates of that disease transmission and mm. higher rates of environmental contamination. So, so it's just sort of this um, circular thing that, that continues driving that um, disease. So, uh, yeah, there's definitely some evidence of that, um, you know, how much that's playing a role overall in the, um, in the, on the landscape, we don't fully understand, but, but some of those areas, things like, um, urban deer populations in some other places, like we, we've seen the situation down in Northwest Montana and the Libby area, um, you know, pretty high rates of, of disease in, in that whitetail population in the city limits. And so there's some some reasons, you know, that that could be, um, just the ecology of urban deer. They're kind of using the same areas, the higher, you know, highly concentrated, not as many, um, pressures from predators or hunters. Right. And so you, you can see kind of more disease, um, transmission in, in those types of situations. Are we finding any sort of like genetic outliers or markers within some of these cervids that are just not getting the CWD or maybe genetic outliers who are more predispositioned to get it? Yeah. Great question. I, I, a short answer is I don't think so. Um, again, that's, mm. that is not my area of expertise, but okay. my understanding is, you know, there's, there's been a fair bit of work looking at caribou and if caribou might have hope, you know, everyone's hopeful because of the conservation concerns around caribou that they might have some resistance and there's no evidence of that. Um, mm. and so, uh, I think, I think the, um, the thinking is that these animals don't build any kind of immunity because it's a, a protein, the, the body, just like, you know, we all have proteins in our bodies. Well, you know, 
the body doesn't recognize it as something foreign or something that's not supposed to be there. Like, a you know, a bacteria or a virus, the body will no, there's something foreign and you get a, an immune response with these proteins. See, there's no immune response. The body doesn't recognize it as anything that shouldn't be there. And so animals don't build immunity over time um, to this. So mm. uh, there's, there's some work and again, not my area of expertise, but, but there's a bodily body of research that's looking at different strains of CWD that are present Um both in North America and they've done some work in, in Europe in the, in the CWD outbreak around Scandinavia, um, that there's different strains of the d- disease that may impact, you know, different um, animals or different species in a different way. Some, you know, some lead to a faster progression of, of disease and, and things like that. But, um, but in all cases, the animal becomes infected and will die ultimately just with some different, um, kind of characteristics along the way. Some of the questions that I had were going to be around identifying animals that have CWD and characteristics that you see in them. And, but I mean, your initial statement about you can't really, Yeah. um, I, I would guess at some point you'd be able to identify if it's, uh, gone far enough down the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what would be some of the observations that somebody would have of that animal, if they say, oh, for sure that one's got CWD and, and, um, are there any like sort of pathological features observed in the affected animals? Sure. Yeah. And we definitely would, you know, want people looking out for those. Right. Um, again, it's, it, it, from what we've seen in other places, it's pretty rare to see sick animals on the landscape. Um, one likely reason for that is that animals start to show that vulnerability and, and predators would recognize that, um, you know, before people would. And so I think that that's what's happened in some places is that predators are sort of taking out those vulnerable sick animals before we see any evidence of disease. Um, but yeah, things to look for in those later stages. So again, this neurological disease, um, there's the classic, if you, you know, you'll see images or videos online of like, severely thin animals that are um, have poor coordination, trembling, drooling, you know, ears down, um, really lethargic. You see images like that online and, and that, that is um, late stage, right? And, and, and different like studies have been able to track that and observe that late stage in like a research setting in a captive setting, they see these animals progress to that. Um, so certainly if we see any animals on the landscape with those types of symptoms, um, that's something our wildlife health program would, would really like to, um, hear about. And, and those are animals that we're going to want to follow up on just in case, you know, so, Mm. so those, um, very thin and neurological symptoms, definitely. Um, even before that happens though, um, when there's changes to the brain, uh, before you see really obvious symptoms showing, there might be some subtle things like uh, animals just sort of appearing to be like not uh, not afraid of people approaching or or you know mm. other you know dogs approaching, just sort of um, not very alert, um, not moving out of the way as as normal behavior would would show generally. Um, that's another reason why road killed samples are a super important sample for us because obviously lots of animals get uh, hit on the road. And so that's a, a really good source of samples, but those animals that um, are starting to have some of those neurological impacts will be more susceptible to getting hit by a vehicle too. Right. And so right. they're almost like a, uh, a, a higher, um, uh, what's the word like higher value sample for us because mm. they, they may be more prone to um, to being hit by a car if they're if they're sick. Um, so yeah, so those are some sort of more subtle uh, observations if if people um, observe something like that. You know, and with all of these things that I'm describing, there's other things out there that could cause these. It's not necessarily chronic wasting disease, but um, we definitely would like to hear about it so that we can follow up and, and, um, you know, just keep track of what's going on because, uh, there's, you know, the, um, 
hunting community and and trapping community and just locals that are on the land like your ears and eyes out there um and so if you're observing anything abnormal um we'd sure like to hear about it and we can follow up so i okay i was going to ask a different question but just <laughs> an easy follow up on that one would be like how how would somebody who would they report that to yeah how how would they let people know and the other question that people, and this was going to be further down the line mm-hmm. was, should somebody try and take that animal out of the ecosystem, but knowing now that it's going to be in the, in the ground and every, everywhere else, like there's that whole ethical thing as well. Right. Yeah. Well, again, I think those are the type of decisions that, you know, if it's reported to us or reported to our conservation officer service or our, our local wildlife biologists, um, we can then, you know, sort of uh, get the, the, the facts of the situation and, and determine if, if it's, a, if maybe we can, we can rule out chronic wasting disease if there's something else that appears to be going on and then it's not, um, as higher risk. But, uh, uh, you know, I think, I think, I don't think we can really encourage people to, um, you know, remove oh. these animals, but definitely let's, you know, reach out and we can, we can, uh, get the facts um, and follow up and then determine if this is something, mm. an animal that we want to go and, and collect a sample from, and then we'll know, but yeah, without the samples, without, you know, photographs and videos are really valuable to us. And those can always be, um, emailed to us, uh, our wildlife health program, um, you know, again, going to the website, all of our contact information is there. And so we can be reached that way through email or phone, um, and our conservation officers too are the, with the RAP line, um, their call center can direct calls to us as well. So, so, so how was, how was testing done? Uh, does, do you see false positives or false negatives at times? And, um, are, are they going to be home testing kits <laughs> that are provided for hunters oh, so they can kind of field test? That's the dream, Travis. That would be great. But, um, <laughs> but no, we, um. So uh, let's, yeah, I'll, I'll explain testing a little bit. And again, the, you know, how important testing is right now. It's so important. Um, it has been uh, a real priority for us in the last few years as the risk level um, increased uh, because it's super important to catch this disease as early as possible. So all the samples um, that we've had, that we've had turned into our testing program, um, they're, they're mainly coming from hunters, which is amazing. And it really just highlights the important partnership there. Um, we need to test a lot of animals to have accurate information about what's going on on the landscape. And so, uh, our approach has been to let's try and access these animals that are already being removed from the landscape. So through hunter harvested animals and roadkill, uh, but still about, you know, 80% of our samples come from hunter harvested animals. So without hunters, we wouldn't have this program. You know, we wouldn't have been able to detect these cases. And hopefully we've, we, because we've really ramped up um, testing in the, in the Kootenai region in the last few years, um, our goal is to catch it as early as possible, right? So that we can um, uh, try and contain it and, and slow the spread. And hopefully that's that's what we've been able to achieve here. But um, yeah, those, those samples are really key. Also working a lot with the trapping community, picking up roadkill that they're using for bait and getting samples that way as well. Um, so once those uh, samples are submitted to us, um, what, what we need to test for CWD are tissues at the back of the throat and the base of the skull. So we're testing mm-hmm. all species in the deer family, deer, elk, moose, and caribou. Um, the majority of, of samples that we receive are from deer, but we're really interested in all those species because they can all, um, uh, they're all susceptible to the disease. So on deer, we collect a specific lymph node at the back of the throat and the tonsils. So all we really need, um, you know, at the beginning, you know, earlier, um, earlier years of this program, we always said, you know, submit your head for testing. And that's still great. If hunters want to turn in a head, we don't want the antlers. You can cut the antlers off the top of the head. We don't need the, the, the brain and the, the top part of the head at all. Um, we're really just targeting those tissues at the back of the throat. So hunters can turn in a head. Um, they can also turn in the low jaw if they want to do a European mount and, and retain that top portion of the head, um, mm. removing the low jaw just by cutting around the, 
the arch at the back of that low jawbone, all the tissues we need are protected in there. And so we've had a lot of hunters just turning those in. And that's a great sample for us. Um, mm -hmm. We're also providing training for hunters if they're interested in um, collecting their own tissues off their own animal. And then they can just literally submit the tonsils and lymph nodes in a Ziploc bag to one of our freezer locations. And, um, and so through our training program, they can also access um, YouTube videos. There's, there's lots of resources online on, on how to collect your own samples. And so we really encourage that too. That's great. Any way that we can make it easy for hunters to turn in those samples, um, you know, we're trying to support that. On the elk, moose, and caribou, we do collect slightly different tissues. So we're still um, collecting the lymph node at the back of the throat, but we need a portion of the brainstem that's right at the base of the skull. And so for that reason, um, we do need the head intact um, if you're going to be submitting the head because we need that portion of the brainstem. And it's it's really just a section, um, it's called the obex, and it's right at the, at the opening at the back of the skull if you remove that first vertebrae. It's right at the back of the skull there. So hunters can turn in the head of elk and moose that you've harvested. Or again, YouTube video or reach out. It's pretty easy to, to get that sample if you want to collect your own samples and then just submit those to one of our freezer locations. And then you can retain the the skull and the head, the you know, the the head intact if you wanted to do something with that. Um, what we use uh, is a as a grapefruit spoon. <laughs> you know, the small oh, little yeah. narrow grapefruit yeah. spoons that we all had in our in our cutlery drawers when we were kids they're really <laughs> hard to find now so if anyone ever uh, is in a thrift store and sees these little grapefruit spoons that would be a great gift to our program but they work really well um, for removing that obex that brainstem sample from the back of the skull um, and uh, anyway so yeah so that's another option for for submitting samples so yeah we're just we're trying to create as many uh, you know, remove as many barriers as possible. If hunters want to mm. keep um, portions for a trophy or, um, you know, if, if it's a larger head, they don't want to have to carry it out of the bush or something like that. You just, you know, it doesn't, you know, it's just a knife and a, and a Ziploc bag and you can collect your own, own samples and submit them that way. And then you get the peace of mind on that CWD result and we get the information to inform what we're doing. Nice. So, and I guess the uh, freezer locations and training videos and all that kind of stuff will be on the CWD website or will there be other links? Yeah. Yeah. We've got all of our freezer locations up on the website. Um, we have okay. some descriptions of, uh, you know, sampling um, instructions on the website as well. And and then YouTube too is a, is a good source for, for different videos. So is there any promising research that's being looked at right now that can give people some hope? I mean, obviously we don't have anything definitive, but are there areas that people are looking at that say, huh, there might be a light at the end of this tunnel right now? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I touched on this a little bit earlier where we are very fortunate in BC that, um, we've had some time, um, and, and the benefit of learning from these other places that have been managing, uh, CWD in their wildlife populations for, you know, two or three decades now. And, mm. um, and especially in, in more research or recent situations where uh, some places in the States um, have detected the disease in the last 10 years. And, and, you know, it's all hinging on detecting it early, catching the disease as mm. early as possible, which really seems to um, increase chances of, of successful management. Um, but mm -hmm. we've got some good evidence now out of the States where if you catch it early and you, you can apply some management, you know, there's some examples now where they've been able to keep disease prevalence really low, like below five or in Illinois, like below 3% after 20 years of the disease being in those wow. deer populations. So, you know, if, if I think that is success, right? If, if you have the disease on your landscape for, for you know after 20 years and you go out there's only a three percent chance that the animal you harvest is going to be infected like that that would be pretty great right and and so yeah. the the big recommendations that are coming out of these these management agencies and the cwd experts is um hunting is our most important tool uh, for managing cwd and 
And it's these these examples where they've had success has mainly focused through you know managing the disease through harvest management. So you mm. understand the disease. And again, that's what we're trying to accomplish right now is really pull all the information together, get the, the you know, the local knowledge and the experts, um, get all that information so we can really understand the the what's happening on on the landscape and what animals are affected and where. And when you have that information, you can focus your, um, you know, management targeting animals that are most likely to be infected on a much like smaller scale. I was talking about the importance of surveillance right now and all those negative results and how that's allowing us to focus in and really, you know, target our, our efforts where it's needed rather than trying to apply a, a strategy over a huge area. You're not going to have as, as much success, right? And mm-hmm. so, um, yeah, just zeroing in on the um, animals that are most likely to be infected. Harvest management, definitely the most important um, tool, and we've seen success. Uh, we're also really focused in, even in these early days before we have a complete picture, we know that there's a risk of moving carcasses around. We don't want, um, we don't want to allow the disease to spread around now that we know that it's present in these areas in the Kootenays we don't want it to spread to other areas and there's a risk with moving carcasses around so we're focusing in you know we're outside of the hunting season now but focusing in on road killed samples and how they're going to be disposed of and where they're being transported and making sure that that's all done really safely um so that you know other actions like that reducing the potential for that spread um, we'll be talking about how we're going to um, approach the, this next hunting season and looking at harvest management as most important tool. Um, you know, some places in in other you know other places have applied some you know really targeted removal of animals. You know, if if they can't mm. achieve their targets through harvest management, they supplement with some targeted removals um, following a hunting season sort of thing to to you know, focus in on those animals that they believe to be infected or higher risk populations or clusters of cases, those types of things, but much more success zeroing in on those small scales than some of the management that was applied 20 years ago uh, or, you know, 20, 30 years ago, like, you know, it, like in the prairies, for example, where um, there were these large scale calls and they just, um, it was effective in slowing the disease, you know, but it was, mm-hmm. Not it was very controversial. It was not supported by the hunting community, um, and so they were not supported. and And those programs were um, were halted. And unfortunately, what's resulted is continued spread and um, uh, of the disease and 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 increasing infection rates. Right. So we've learned from that, and we've learned about the importance of of really understanding the situation, so you can target your approaches. And um, working, you know, really closely with the hunting communities as as a partner in this, because that, you know, hunting is is the most important tool. And, and that's that's a, that's the advice that's coming out of these these places in the states that have learned. Um, you know, we've we've got a couple of decades now lessons learned and, and we hope to apply that mm-hmm. in B.C. now. Well, what are some of the biggest challenges or obstacles that researchers and policymakers are encountering when it comes to effectively uh, working through this issue? And w- what sort of uh, ways can the public help overcome this? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, there's lots of little challenges and, and we, again, learning from other places, we've we've had um, advice from these other you know, management agencies saying, you know, this, these are the challenges that we faced. And so, you know, we could be proactive here in BC to, to try and identify those and mitigate those ahead of time. And so that's what we've been trying to do is listening to our partners in other places and our colleagues and, and, um, and try and set us up um, you know, for success in BC. So we've been putting a ton of um, effort into that planning. And, uh, and fortunately, um, I mean, we've been doing surveillance for CWD in BC f- since for 20 years, since the early 2000s. And, um, mm. and, and back in, in the in the early 2000s, my, my, 
um, boss at that time, Dr. Helen Swancha, the provincial wildlife vet, um, mm-hmm. in her wisdom, she set up uh, advisory an advisory committee and some working groups, uh, local working groups in the areas. Now, this is like 2006. She identified, you know, the Kootenai region and the Peace region because we're bordering with Alberta. And at that time, those are where the closest cases were. We need to set up some advisory teams that include, you know, our agency partners, experts, the, you know, hunting communities and the, the, the stakeholder groups, or, you know, First Nations, and get all of those um, minds together at a table so that we can be collaborative in this and, um, and, and develop this program together. And so I think that's really a strength of our program and, and, and is going to set us up for success. Uh, it's not going to be easy. There's, you know, there's, mm. there's, there's very, very few examples out there where, where things have gone perfectly. But um, I think having had these, uh, these working groups established and, and this, this collaborative team, um, we've been working together for, you know, 20 years now and have some a really uh, um, strong foundation in partnership and communication, and they've um, provided input on our surveillance and response plan, which we update all the time because there's all this new information. So we have continually updated that. And the plan's available on our website as well. If anyone wants to have a look at it, it details, um, you know, the the steps that we propose and then this initial response phase. It's 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 on our website. Um, but having all of those that input and that partnership at the at the table, I think, is really going to help us uh, along in in this. Um, and there there'll definitely going to be some bumps in the road, but um, but if we can work together and um, and through everybody's networks of you know communication and education and um, connection with the hunting community and the trapping community and accessing those samples and everyone just kind of doing their part. And we said in the beginning, um, I said in the beginning, how amazing just in week one, it's been, it's been pretty intense, but what's been really, um, you know, honestly heartwarming is, is all these groups that have reached out and just said, how can we help? What do you need me to do? Mm. We have those, those, uh, all those relationships um, established and, and everybody is familiar with, with the plan and we can just hit the ground running. So, um, so that's what we're trying to do. So how can we help? We can submit samples for testing. We can get grapefruit spoons from the, <laughs> yes. uh, right? send those ones on in. We can share this with other people so yeah. they can point them to the links to yeah. the website where people can, can find this information and um, join in, join in in the conversation and be, be involved as we're all stakeholders. Absolutely. I mean, it's not us and the animals, yeah. we're, it's this is us, right? Absolutely. It's all about us. Yeah. Yeah. All that input is really valuable. We always welcome, you know, hearing from, from, um, from folks that contact us directly and, you know, they've got some local, um, insight. They've got, you know, questions. It just helps us to understand what the concerns are and, and what the values are on the landscape. And that, that really, um, you know, guides our, our work. So. Did you want to uh, try some rapid fire? Like you've been very thorough in all of your answers here and you've actually answered a number of the questions that people have come up with okay. and we can always just refer them back. But okay. Want to try rapid fire, a bunch of questions from the uh, public? Sure, let's do it. Okay. Answer the public. So Jason Subkowitz says, uh, and I'll condense it, essentially um, he's in Ontario and they can bait their white-tailed deer over there and wants to know thoughts on baiting deer Mm -hmm. and how that relates with chronic wasting disease. Right. Oh man. Rapid fire this. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we don't, you don't, we don't have to rapid fire. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Well, let me do my best. Um, some will be some. Right. Okay. So, so yeah, we've identified, um, baiting as, and, and consistent with other places, uh, in North America that have implemented, uh, you know, bans on baiting because we know that these baiting, bringing animals in, we talked about this a little bit already, it has the potential of increasing disease transmission and, and these uh, CWD hotspots. So so it's something that is definitely on our list of, of risks and, and something that we would try to, to reduce those risks. Okay. Um, here's one which is, uh, it was a, 
condensed. It was very emotional. It's a well-known, uh, butcher who's, uh, deals with bovine all the time. And he wants to know why there's a different approach and response to, uh, mad cow BSE than there is to CWD. He says in the UK, at least previously, they're testing every single beef that, that went through. Mm-hmm. Um, and we don't have that same level of stringency. Is there, is that, would that be a political thing that we're not touching here? Would that be a, uh, a scientific thing that, that might have an answer <laughs> behind it? I mean, I, I can, I can try and respond a little bit. And again, not super familiar with, with the response to, to BSE. Um, mm. it's, you know, just in general, it's, it's a different environment to be working in when you're working with captive animals versus free ranging animals. It's, it's, you know, there's, it's apples and oranges, right? Um, yes, we want to be testing as many animals as possible because that provides us with really important information so that we can base our decisions and our actions on science and, and that, that, uh, that data. But, um, but you know, it's, it's not always practical to, uh, access every single animal, but, you know, we have targeted some of our efforts, like with our mandatory testing under the hunting license, um, in specific management units in the Kootenays that was done because we identified those as higher risk areas. And we really, it was so critical that we got this information from those units. And sure enough, that, that hunting license condition and the mandatory testing, it did exactly what we needed it to do. It increased our sample mm. numbers and that's where we got our first two positive cases. So, you know, mm. if, if we didn't have that, um, that level of information from those units, we might've missed these. And so, you know, that's, that's been really important. And so we have taken some action to, to, uh, you know, make it mandatory for testing, but for now it's really been focused in on specific areas. Uh, turnaround time on testing. So he submits a sample for testing, they process the animal, it's in the freezer, it's, it's stored somewhere. Uh, what, what does that turnaround time kind of look like? Yeah. The turnaround on testing has been, um, a real challenge. Uh, I can say that, you know, across Canada, um, there's really a limited, uh, capacity in labs that are able to do the diagnostic test for CWD. And as it become, as it continues to spread, programs are expanding the, um, pressure on these few lab facilities that do the testing has just increased. And so what that has meant for BC, we've always sent our, um, samples, uh, to a lab in Saskatchewan and they've been great to us, but over time, those turnaround time on results have just been getting longer and longer because of the demand on those facilities. And, um, and yeah, they're just, there hasn't been the resources to, um, to increase that capacity, uh, you know, in, in this, in the same rate that it, programs are expanding. Right. Mm. And so that has been an issue. And I think, the last couple of years were were our, our worst years for turnaround on results, and I know that's very frustrating for hunters, and it's frustrating for us too because we want that information so that we can, um, you know, inform our risk and everything, right? Uh, so, so we're we're trying really hard to um, to streamline that process as much as we can with with you know the the resources that we have available. Um, in the you know coming years, uh, we hope that we're going to be able to increase efficiency in testing. We're going to be setting up a, a BC testing uh, facility uh, at our BC Agriculture Lab. Um, just coming up now, I uh, think we're going to submit our first samples next week. And so we're hoping that that's going to help. This is the first time we've had uh, access to a lab in BC. And we're hoping that mm. that's going to help. Um, with the turnaround time on results. And, and now with the CWD detection, I think, um, you know, there's even more support for, for getting that system, you know, as streamlined as possible so that we can get, have access mm. to that, the, the, the results as soon as possible. Within the management plan of CWD, has there been any conversation or consideration to reissuance of a tag if a hunter canceled their tag and had a positive result? Yeah, that's a really good question. And of course it's come up, um, you know, it's something that we will 
you know, consider, I'm sure. Uh, there hasn't been a, a lot of discussion on that front so far. Um, but we know from examples from other places, they've been able to do this. I know, you know, in Alberta issued a, a replacement tag for a while um, until the number of cases just became uh, sort of um, overwhelming to them. And, and, and the, mm. in that situation, they, it wasn't feasible to issue replacement tags anymore. So every situation is different. And, um, and we're going to have to evaluate that for in the BC context to see what's going to make sense for, for, for us here. So I butcher my own meat. I'm very fortunate. My wife's a Red Seal chef and part of her training was nice. to have butchery training and all the rest. Mm -hmm. So I've got a lot of help there, which is really good. <laughs> or maybe she's got help from me <laughs> in doing yeah. it, but, um, but a lot of people don't. If you have a CWD animal mm -hmm. and you've taken it to the butcher and now we know about these prions and how they can transmit, mm -hmm. um, what happens now? Or do we now have a, a full butcher, uh, supply full of animals that could have been clean, but are now being put out with these prions? Yeah, I think, um, butchers have some pretty strict protocols, um, within their, you know, practices that, you know, mm -hmm. decontaminating between, you know, animals and, and making sure that animals are, um, processed, uh, individually. Again, I'm not, um, super familiar with that process, but that is my understanding that, um, mm. that, you know, hunters have to follow some pretty, or, or rather, sorry, meat cutters have to follow some pretty strict, um, standards on that, on that front. So yeah, I, you know, obviously if a, if a CW positive animal is submitted to a, to a butcher, you know, there, there would be some, some follow up and making sure that, you know, all the all the T's were crossed, but, um, I trust that, you know, that, that system, um, you know, their, their practices are, are dialed and, uh, and, and that's sort of their, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's their, that's their realm. <laughs> that's their right. Yeah. Fair enough. So here we had an interesting question because, you know, a lot of these prions are going to be found in the spine or brain is typical knowledge. Now we're learning about in the, uh, in the, what would you say? The lymph nodes? Lymph the nodes throat, the, yeah. Yes. So, I uh, now we don't have confirmed cases of a, a transmission from the animal to the human. It's recommended that the human, if they have a positive result, that they dispose of it and they do it properly, preferably through incineration, through, through the province and, but are they able to minimize the spread of prions through proper butchery techniques that can avoid cutting into the spine, into the brain and into these areas. So mm -hmm. if they wanted to make that educated decision themselves, they're rolling those discs, those dice in a, maybe a more favorable way. Yeah. Well, what we can say to that is, um, we know that these prions can be present in any part of the body, but they, mm -hmm. they do tend to concentrate in certain tissues we call high risk tissues. And that includes, you know, the central nervous system, the spinal cord, the brain, um, yeah, these lymph nodes and organs, they do those, those types of tissues in the body do tend to have a higher concentration of prion material. And so mm. the advice is that if possible, limit handling of that limit cutting through, you know, the spinal cord and, and, um, contaminating your tools, um, as much as, as much as possible, just to, to limit the handling of that and then, um, proper cleanup afterwards. Right. So, um, uh, decontaminating surfaces, making sure tools are cleaned, uh, as much as we, as we've talked about how these prions are indestructible, there's actually some, uh, paper, uh, that was published, uh, recently, in the last few years that, uh, indicated that a 40% bleach solution, uh, on metal surfaces will help to, um, sort of deactivate those prions. And so, uh, mm. so that applies to, you know, knives and, and, you know, a stainless steel, you know, bench, if you've got something like that. Um, so getting a good bleach wash of those is recommended. Um, does it's, you know, it, mm. it's not, doesn't seem to be as effective on other surfaces like concrete or wood or, you know, those types of things, mm. but it, you know, that's, that's how we clean up our, our, uh, 
um, spaces when we're sampling is, is a good bleach solution. So, you know, just general, um, general hygiene as well. If you can wear gloves when you're handling this material, wash your hands, all that kind of stuff, which is, you know, just kind of applies to everything. But, uh, yeah. Interesting. 40% bleach. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I like that. I've always used quat, which is what they use in the restaurant industries, mm -hmm. but I'm, this is probably, uh, cheaper, easier, better. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, it, I don't think it's, um, will, uh, get rid of all of the prions. Like mm. there's still potential, but it, it does seem to help. So here's my question. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that we should talk about? Wow. I think we've, uh, we've covered a lot of bases. I'm trying to think of what mm -hmm. we talked about. We've had a good, good long conversation uh, here. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I just, I just really appreciate, um, you know, I know I've already said it, but I just want to reiterate the, um, how much we value our partnerships out there, especially with the hunting community, um, and, and our stakeholder groups, um, they really are the advocates for wildlife out there. And it's, um, it's been really rewarding in my career to work with those groups and see the passion and, and dedication and everyone showing up to volunteer and, and, and just help out wherever they can. Um, so I just, I just, I guess I just want to say thank you for that and, and for that support and just to say, you know, you really are, um, you really do have an important role in this. Um, we hope, we hope to, to move through this CWD situation and, you know, in, in lockstep with, with those groups. I know everybody is wanting the same thing and we just, uh, um, really appreciate having that support. Um, so, so yeah, just a, just a shout out there. <laughs> well, Kate, I'm sure I can speak for anyone who's watching or listening. We really appreciate you taking the time to give this information in a very thorough fashion. And we're going to have links on the website, links on the description so people can see where they can find more information as it evolves but thank you very much for being on the silver core podcast thank you so much travis